So on Saturday, uh, Hezbollah massacred 12 children in Israel in the Golan Heights town of Majd el Shams. 12 Druze children playing soccer uh, were torn apart, literally, uh, by a Hezbollah rocket uh, that was fired from South Lebanon. And since then, the talk of a massive escalation one way or another has been rife. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, cut short his visit in the United States, got on the plane and flew back home and has been ensconced with the security cabinet ever since trying to put together the proper way of handling this. Um, and there's a lot of talk about what the situation is in Lebanon. How are we supposed to look at Hezbollah uh, in the context of Lebanon with the Druze in Lebanon, the Druze obviously in Syria, the Druze in Syria also declared war on the Hezbollah in Iran. Uh, in the aftermath of the attack on the children in Majd el Shams. So there's a lot going on. And of course, on top of all of that, layered on top of everything, is the Biden administration and their uh, ubiquitous mediator, Amos Hochstein, who immediately swept into action to make a deal. And so trying to make sense of all of this, the first person that I thought was necessary to discuss uh, the situation with is my old friend, and many of you already know him from the Carolyn Glick show, Tony Badron. Uh, so first of all, welcome, Tony, back to the Carolyn Glick show. It's so great to be back with you. Thank you. I wish you were under better circumstances, Tony. I, all of you will recall is a native of Lebanon, and he immigrated happily to the United States and legally. Uh, and today serves as uh, the news editor at one of my favorite publications, obviously a distant second to JNS, but uh, Tablet Magazine. Um, so uh, Tony is my go-to guy on Lebanon. And so here we are talking about Lebanon and I went to Tony. So um, Tony, let's just jump into it. Why much Dil Shams? What, why, first of all, how do you explain from the perspective of Hezbollah, if you had to get into their head, what, why were they attacking in, in the Golan Heights and, and attack these children? Um, so that's a that's an excellent question. So the Hezbollah, even prior to October 7, had, you'll remember, in the spring, I mean, this is now kind of in memory hold, but in the spring of last year, uh, Hezbollah entered the Golan Heights and established a military encampment in the Golan Heights. That was a major crisis for, for a while. Uh, Are you talking and, about the tent that they erected right. in, the, in, in, the, in Mount Dove area, what they call the Shabba Farms? Correct. So this was a focus of theirs from, from back then. Uh, and uh, this, um, you know, again, at the time, Amos Hochstein intervened to tell the Israelis, do not attack, do not take it out, and so on. So at the time, Hezbollah was very clear that, the, that they wanted to sort of reactivate that, the, the front of the Golan and to, and it was in tandem, it was calculated and they said so explicitly in order to, um, provide their uh, sort of leverage or their impetus uh, to what Hofstein was already trying to do, which is to settle the, uh, uh, delineate the land border as a follow-up to his maritime deal. Uh, fast, and then, you know, they started, obviously on October 8th, they started firing and they've lit up the entire front and in, in deep into Israel. Uh, but curiously, um, on sort of in early July, early this month, Hezbollah media uh, revealed something interesting that in his uh, trip to Beirut, his last trip to Beirut, uh, Hochstein uh, apparently uh, offered them the following because, you know, they're trying to uh, get a ceasefire in Gaza. The administration has adopted the Hezbollah view that the, that the Lebanon front will not shut down until there's a ceasefire in Gaza. So the United States has legitimized the linkage of Gaza and, and Lebanon. And as part of that, uh, Hochstein says to them, uh, uh, how about this? How about you calm down the front uh, from, you know, the entirety of the blue line? Okay, so this way the Lebanese left the uh, uh, their homes in the south can go back and the Israelis who have been forced to leave their homes in the north can. And then you can limit your attacks to the Shaba Farms area. Uh, now, also another thing here to note that uh, in August, late August, the United States, the Biden administration, for the first time ever, 
uh, introduced language in the United Nations Security Council resolution that renewed the UNIFIL mandate. They introduced language that described the Shabbat farms as occupied. Even so, wait, I want to just go back because um, I'm sorry, guys. Tony and I have an ongoing conversation, and the problem is that we're, giving, we're, we're entering it in midstream, and I want to just bring you guys all up to speed. So just so you understand what we're talking about, Amos Holstein is uh, President Biden's envoy to Lebanon. He, he has a lot of other titles, but his basic job description is to suck up to Hezbollah for the United States government, not to put too fine a point on it, and to do it at Israel's expense. So I don't know if you guys recall, um, but just you know, a few days before Israel's election in 2022, Amos Hochstein you bore the whole, the full weight of the U.S. government led by Biden on the lame duck government led by Yair Lapid, who was just an interim prime minister. He had no mandate for anything, to force him to capitulate to Hezbollah's demands in a in a negotiation that had been protracted for I think a decade over the maritime border of Israel and Lebanon, because Lebanon, controlled by Hezbollah, uh, had been demanding parts of the areas that Israel had legitimately claimed as its economic waters on the one hand and its territorial waters on the other. And the Trump administration had been negotiating a deal and they had sort of reached a stalemate at 60-40 on behalf of Lebanon, even though their claims are completely baseless, just to try to get to an end of it. When that was where they sort of were stalemated, Biden came in and he demanded that Israel accept all of Hezbollah's demands on the on the maritime uh, on the maritime issue. And so Lapid, in an act of great statesmanship, signed a historic deal with Lebanon that was going to give us peace in our time. And he he bowed to all of Hezbollah's demands for uh, our territorial and economic waters gave a suspected gas field to Lebanon, controlled by Hezbollah, lock, stock, and barrel, with nothing for Israel in this, except a promise by Total Energy uh, to uh, to give us some money in the future. So it was a complete and utter humiliating surrender by Israel, not so much to Hezbollah as it was to American extortion by the Biden administration on the eve of an election that then Yair Lapid proceeded to lose but whatever that was what he did and but what we what uh, tony and others were pointing out at the time was that uh, hezbollah's territorial demands for israel didn't end with the water line they go on and extend from west from the from the coast of Nauria all the way to the syrian border uh, on the golan heights and the most important area that they're demanding is mount do which they pretend is just a little thing by calling it Sheba Farms. Mount Dove controls all of northern Israel. It's a huge land mass in the northern Golan Heights, not far from Manchdil Shams, that controls all of northern Israel. You control Mount Dove, you control everything down to the Gulf of Haifa and even further. So this is what Hezbollah demands. And so rather than letting by, you know, saying, okay, Hezbollah is satisfied. After all, you, you feed the tiger, you whet its appetite for more. And so they got everything that they wanted from the Lapid government. And Hochstein has been placing pressure on the Netanyahu government preceding October 7th to uh, capitulate to Hezbollah's demands for land. And um, so what, what Tony is saying here is that in July, earlier this month, the Hezbollah media in Lebanon reported that Hochstein had made them a deal that said, OK, guys, um, we're going to accept completely your position that your unwarranted aggression against Israel beginning on October 8th is part and parcel of Hamas's genocidal invasion of Israel on October 7th, totally legitimate. And um, you're going to, and, and the minute that we get Israel to capitulate to Hamas's demands in Gaza, um, we'll reach some sort of a deal with you to get Israel to capitulate to a minimal amount of your your demands, and then you're going to stop shooting at Israel also, except for one place, and we accept this. You can continue to shoot at the northern Golan Heights, at what we call the Sheba Farms, which is Mount Dove, which is adjacent to Majdal Shops. So did I do a good summary of how oh, we got to this one? Point? Absolutely fantastic, yeah. The, the, just one thing, the it's not that you know, Hezbollah added new demands pertaining to land. 
the delineation of the land border was baked in. It was written in the maritime deal as a follow-up. That was something that needed to be then, uh, you know, uh, agreed on by the parties as a follow-up to the maritime deal. Which is why they, uh, which is why Hezbollah in spring of last year acted the Shaba farms. And remember Ghajar, there was a whole thing about the village of Ghajar. Again, that was reactivated at the time so that they can start stirring there to prepare the grounds for Hochstein to come and do exactly like, and, and they, were, they spoke about it ex explicitly. So they, they drew an analogy, Hezbollah did, to what they did with the uh, Karish um, uh, platform, the gas platform, when they sent the drones. You know, they said, we did this. This activated the, the process in our favor. And then the Americans came and did what we wanted. Right. And, and just so one last thing. I'm going to interrupt you one more time, Tony, just to just to, again, get you guys up to speed. So what happened was the reason why the United States swooped into action and extorted the steel from from uh, Lapid to begin with was because Hezbollah had shot drones at Israel's natural gas platform in the eastern Mediterranean, Karish, and threatened to blow it up. And so... Uh, the United States said, okay, Israel, you like nice little gas platform you got there. Uh, it would be a pity if something happened to it. And the way you protect it is by paying protection to Hezbollah. And the way you pay protection to Hezbollah is by capitulating to their demands, right? That you that you, you surrender your maritime uh, borders to them. You surrender your economic zone. You surrender your, your territorial waters to them. And this other gas platform, which miraculously, literally, it was an act of God. They didn't find any gas, gas in it to begin with at, at, in the end. But um, the point is just that uh, the Americans have been acting as Hezbollah's mafia, mafia lawyer the entire time. So just as they attacked, just as they t attacked Karish, and then that instigated the Biden administration's extortion of Israel. So, as Tony said last spring, they attacked, they put that, that tent up in Mount Dove. Uh, in the Golan Heights, in order, again, to precipitate the Americans coming in and demanding Israeli capitulation to their demands for our our territory, our land uh, in northern Israel. And so with the with the UNIFIL mandate, UNIFIL is the UN force uh, that's a, a phony force that's supposed to, you know, force uh, Hezbollah not to operate in South Lebanon and they do nothing. Um, so the United States renewed its mandate, and in the in the UN Security Council resolution renewing the UNIFIL's mandate, uh, they uh, seemed to they did in fact uh, withdraw U.S. recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, a position that a move that the Trump administration had taken uh, by calling it what do they call it? The occupied Sheba Farms. Occupied Sheba Farms. So again, the United States just uh, completely uh, capitulated to Hezbollah, is operating as Hezbollah's attorney. Now, just keep that in mind, because it's a hard thing to get your brain around. But the United States is serving as, you know, the the as as the mob lawyer right now, and Hezbollah is the mob, and Amos Hochstein is playing, uh, is playing uh, um, uh, the mob, the, the role of the mob lawyer in uh, in this godfather. Right. Right. No. So, I mean, this is the thing that people miss with the maritime deal that you that you so succinctly, you know, summarized is that um, everybody got stuck on, you know, how much gas and how much money and blah, blah, blah. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that the United States had set a precedent that the United States had injected itself between Israel and an Iranian terrorist organization on equal footing as an arbiter and set up this mechanism, this official mechanism, the explicit purpose of which was to provide security for Lebanon as a Hezbollah-run territory, right? Not as, you know, a fictional land of, uh, you know, peace and states and neutrality that doesn't exist, as a Hezbollah base. So that is what they did with, with, with the maritime deal. They set these new modalities and these new restrictions on Israeli activity in, in uh, uh, potential military activity in Lebanon by increasing all this American and international investment in it as to act as constraints 
uh, against military uh, activity against Hezbollah. And this is important. We'll come back to that in a second, because that's the foundation, of the initiative that the Americans are now trying to press on, on Hezbollah. It's not just that they want to revise, you know, to settle the blue line and, and do territorial swaps and so on. Uh, um, it's also the, the, the basis of um, uh, their re revision of 1701, the resolution uh, that ended the 2006 war, which was a farcical resolution from the get-go because it's entirely predicated on the cooperation of the so-called Lebanese government, which is Hezbollah. So the, 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 the monitoring, the clearing of the area south of the Litani and so on and so forth, all of that has to be done with the Lebanese armed forces and the Lebanese government, which is to say Hezbollah. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. It's, it just reflects the, the idiocy uh, at the time in the Bush in the yeah in the W Bush administration that served as the foundation that then Obama took uh, thank you very much and now we're just going to take this to the next step and turn Lebanon basically Hezbollah into um, to place it under American protection effectively uh, as part of Obama's um, tilt uh, towards Iran but in that was that's that's the um, diplomatic context for Hochstein's activity. So the singling out of the Sheba farms was very notable. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't, uh, my, the reason why I raised the issue, I took it back so, so far back to the spray is because it doesn't come in a vacuum, that this is, a, this, this is part of a threat that's been going on, an initiative that predates even the October war. And now they're telling Hezbollah that, uh, that, that the United States is going to honor that, to continue that in, in, in order to get uh, this diplomatic agreement that they're working on that in part has to do with with uh, territorial uh, issues, uh, but also territorial issues that have nothing to do with Lebanon, meaning that it touches now, it revises the status of the Golan itself. Okay, And you can see that in the weird verbiage that's being used um, both by... Uh, administration officials like the ambassador, Jack Liu, for instance, this weird uh, statement about, uh, you know, Drew's children was like, okay, like M M whose, whose nationality is ambiguous, whose place, like the, whose geography is ambiguous, whose, you know, like where do they, whose polity is ambiguous on the one hand. And on the other hand, across the board in um, the U.S. media, you have this very precise uh, term of art, uh, the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights, right? But, I mean, the Washington Post being, you know, the nuts that they are, went and just like occupied Golan Heights, right? But at least I can respect that <laughs> because occupied Golan Heights is just the, you know, it's just the other side, right? That's how they, they see it. Israeli-controlled Golan Heights is far more precise. And that language reflect that's a term of art. That language reflects the precise position of the Biden administration, which in 2021, winter of 21, when they came in to office, they were asked immediately about uh, the recognition of uh, Israeli sovereignty in the Golan Heights. And Anthony Blinken, the state uh, the secretary of state, said, look, the legal issue is a separate matter. In practical terms, so he already split that. Like we're we're making a determination about the legality of of the status of the Golan Heights, but in terms of a practical uh, matter, uh, the Israeli control of the Golan Heights, so long as the Iranians are in the Golan Heights and blah 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 things in Syria. So he made it contingent. So Israeli control is contingent for now. We'll discuss. You know, we're not going to raise it for now. We we might raise it in, in in the future, but the legality of it is a different matter. That's the official position of the Biden administration. And then for for many many years afterwards, all the way to the incident I mentioned with the um, Unifil mandate, that's when you know I I broke that story at the time, and I, I was like, this is what these guys wrote. This is what these guys slipped by in this um, resolution. Resolution. And it and it and it created a storm. And the funny thing about it is that they never denied it. Barbara Leaf is on 
record talking about, you know, the Shaba farms as a potential, you know, what Amos is going to do. Well, we'll see, you know, so so it, they even like they're so ideologically committed to it that they that they couldn't even just like lie about it. So they kept saying the policy hasn't changed. Well, you know, I know that the policy hasn't changed in the sense that you haven't made a de jure um, uh, decision to rescind it. But de facto, or to use your terminology, as a practical matter, you actually did introduce a change. And you, you did it in the preferred way of the Obama team, which is through the back door of the Security Council, which is how these guys do. That. Okay, so wait, so we have the American perfidy, their, their effective support for Hezbollah against Israel, the fact that since oh, since Biden, I was going to say Obama, but since Biden came back to office in uh, January 2021, they have been acting as uh, as the mafia mafia attorney for, for the godfather Nasrallah. Right. And uh, they're Michael Duval. Amos Hochstein is is Michael Duval uh, to uh, Marlon Brando, Hassan uh, Nasrallah, uh, and and that's where the United States is today. And now we have these twelve children who are dead, and we have uh, a very uh, I I called you because and and then you you didn't scoff at it, but you said no, you know this is a this is something you guys don't understand. I called you up and I said Tony, you know they're Druze. And we have this declaration of war by the Druze in Syria. And I'm wondering, you know, how is uh, Walid Jumblat in Lebanon, who is the head of the Druze in Lebanon, going to respond to this? Did, did Hassan Nasrallah was now trying to blame Israel for the, for the rocket that he shot and claim, you know, all kinds of lies? Um, uh, is, did he wake up a, a dragon? Are the Druze now going to you know, come into action and stand with Israel and, and we'll, we'll slay Hezbollah together. And you, you said, no, it's not, that's not a, a feasible, uh, it's not a feasible option. Um, and then we're looking towards, you know, a situation where, well, what, what can Israel reasonably expect a from the Druze in a response and B, how are we supposed to look at the situation given that the United States is playing the role of Michael Duval to, to Hassan Nasrallah's, uh, uh, Godfather, right. um, where? How do you see Israel navigating this? We have an existential threat emanating from Lebanon. Quite simply, uh, this past week I wrote an article on Friday where I was talking about the Kuwaiti newspaper report in Algeria that said that Lebanon IRGC uh, sources told the newspaper that they had transferred electromagnetic pulse bombs to to Lebanon to Hezbollah, meaning you know that's basically a nuclear weapon. And um, that'll that'll fry Israel's grid. That'll make Israel paralyzed, and that'll be the end of that. So you know, I said that was already a reason why we have to imminently operate in Lebanon. But you know, what to do and what can we expect? So first of all, explain the situation sociologically, or whatever you want to call it, in Lebanon. How are the people on the ground looking at this? The whole long-standing debate. Does Hezbollah has they have they lost the allegiance of the uh, Lebanese? Where does where does that stand now after after this uh, uh, disaster that they that they carried out? So plain and simple, the one of the biggest traps that the Lebanese do, and they're very good at it because this is in their DNA and it goes back thousands of years in that in the people who inhabited that state that geography across the ages, right? They're very good at sucking people into their dynamics, which are 100% irrelevant, completely irrelevant. As far as Israel is concerned, any and all of its military planning with regards to Hezbollah uh, uh, has absolutely zero, uh, the Lebanese uh, internal scene has zero effect on that, nothing. It should not factor in in any way uh, what, whether or not the people like or don't like or whatever, all these categories that are in, in themselves dumb. Who cares if they like them or they don't like them? What you need to see is the actual behavior of people. And the behavior of people is that they all line up for them. And in fact, all the people, including those who call themselves anti-Hezbollah, are lining up to act as bagmen. 
they're the ones, in fact, very specifically, because like once they take their card out and say, hey, we're anti-Hezbollah, then, then they proceed to make Hezbollah's case that Israel should withdraw, Israel should do this, Israel should do that. They become, you're talking about the mob lawyer, there's a mob lawyer and there's the mob bagman. And the Lebanese government and the Lebanese anti-Hezbollah, the chattering class from Washington to Dubai via London and Paris, all of these people are all bagmen for Hezbollah. They're all running their thing. So the notion that Israel's activity is contingent on the behavior of the Lebanese, that's completely false and wrong. Israel's problem in Lebanon is not a political problem. Israel's problem in Lebanon is a military problem. It's a problem of territory and military. So they're uh, planning as to what they need to do and what they need to bomb and what they need to take out and what buffer zone they need to create. And all of these things are completely uh, uh, unrelated and unaffected by what the so-called Lebanese people, how they feel about Hezbollah on any given day. The fact that they're backing Hezbollah's linkage of Gaza to Lebanon itself should tell you how all of this stuff that you've been hearing from experts in Washington, you know, from, from the Washington Institute to INSS, right? All of this nonsense about, oh, the Lebanese, they're, you know, Hezbollah is in a weak spot. It has lost popularity. Nonsense. These people are selling you snake oil. It's nonsense. It's irrelevant. Why is it irrelevant? Because what the Lebanese people do, Hezbollah doesn't care on the one hand, That's irrespective of what their position is. And I'm telling you that their position is supportive. It's not anti, it's supportive. It's verbally anti, behaviorally supportive. Gotcha. And, uh, uh, but irrespective, Hezbollah doesn't care. Hezbollah just simply does, right? It does, and then everyone follows, and everyone follows suit. And you brought up Walid Jumblat. What's Walid Jumblat's uh, reaction? He backed the, the position that this was not Hezbollah. It wasn't Hezbollah, it was Israel. That's what happened. Because he is not going to put himself in a position against Hezbollah. Because if he were, he would be slaughtered. Okay? So, but, but, but it's not out of fear only. There's something out. The Lebanese only care about their internal, uh, about like trying to avoid internal infighting. So they project their problems ex externally, outward, and then they invite the, outward, the outside world to come in and arbiter and, 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 and also pr provide protection for them. And that's what's happening in this case. And the United States is playing that role. Now, the problem with the United States position in playing that role, which, like I said, was codified in that maritime deal, is that now it affects Israeli sovereignty too. Because now all of a sudden the United States is starting to treat Lebanon and Israel. Lebanon is a fictional place. It's a non-entity. It's just territory governed by a terrorist organization. And Israel, which is a real state, okay? Now they're treating them as the same thing. And if you're treating the two different things, you know, then you, effectively what you're, you're turning Israel into a third world, you know, just mass of land that's run by a terror group, right? So you're giving them both equal status, and that's the problem in this case because it, your, 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 this position of the United States erodes Israeli sovereignty, and that is being shown in how now the United States is putting veto on what Israel can strike in Lebanon. The first reaction of the administration was through one of their mouthpieces, uh, Barak Ravi, is to is to say, oh. Uh, we warned the Israelis that you can't strike Beirut. Really? Why not? And, well, because uh, it can uh, things can get out of hand. Right. So now the United States can tell Israel you can't do this and you can't strike here. You can't go. I mean, and this I mean goes this goes back to October seventh. The first thing they said, uh, actually October eighth, rather on October eighth, that the first thing that the administration said was, uh, no, you can't go bomb in, in Lebanon. Right. And everyone in Israel thought that when they sent those aircraft, the, the carrier group to the Mediterranean, that they're expressing support to Israel. They're not expressing support to Israel. They were deterring Israel against taking action in Lebanon. It's part of that protection that they have extended to Hezbollah de facto uh, in, 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 uh, after, after, you know, 
following on the uh, maritime deal and just the general thrust of the policy. But my point is the problem for Israel is a military problem and increasingly a problem to be able to assert its sovereign decision making and in, in terms of national security vis-a-vis -vis the United States that, see, that seeks to cur curtail that <clears throat> autonomy or that sovereignty uh, when it comes to military activity in Lebanon. And now also like what we saw with the Golan, now all of a sudden you're expanding it. What else? Well, now now in Gaza, well, wait, now, now Israel can't really operate with the Palestinians according to a sovereign decision-making process because Hezbollah might intervene. And then since we tell you that you can't have Hezbollah, now all of a sudden you have to sit down at the table with Hezbollah and negotiate something pertaining to the Palestinians. And then now we're opening up the Golan Heights door. So all of a sudden they're taking this, 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 this uh, uh, province of Lebanon that they've declared as an American protectorate, basically. And through that, they're governing things in Israel itself and in Israel's national security sphere and, and, and defense policy. And that's a very dangerous place for Israel. All right. So... So the United States, it's interesting because I wanted to talk to you about Lebanon, but I, I, in the sense that, okay, how do we how do we look at Lebanon? And you're saying the answer is very clear. You know, it's not a tapestry. Don't look at it with all of the permutations. Maybe there's some tactical intelligence to be had in this village against that village or whatever. Right. But, you know, beyond the micro-tactical level of, you know, of of, uh, of at most a brigade, you're you're looking at it this wrong. That the problem here, you have to look at three maximum four pieces. One is Israel, one is America, one is Iran, and the fourth piece, which is a little bit separate but not really from Iran, is Hezbollah. And if you just simplify the the the, the question to those three and a half actors then everything becomes far more apparent that what we're facing here is a, a sort of a, a three-headed or, or an axis that is arrayed against Israel that the United States is a member of. In fact, it's leading. And you can put Hamas in as another you know, auxiliary member of this, where through uh, aggression against Israel, by Iran and its proxies in Lebanon and in Gaza, the United States is is enabling Iran to essentially put Israel into a strategic straitjacket. That you know you use these you use these distractions like uh, you know what are the villagers going to say? What are the Christians going to say? And the Lebanese people are going to rise up against Hezbollah, which is all a lie because they'll all be killed if they even try. So it doesn't matter. They're irrelevant regardless of whether they're, you know, standing with Israel or not standing with Israel. They have no strategic importance on this, in this picture of these, you know, four heads or so that are, that are operating. Not only that, their position is always 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 without fail across the board across all the tapestry that you that you talked about always leads to the same place get the americans and the iranians to agree so that we can have peace and protection by the americans against israel that's the, that's the bottom line across the board any analyst any politician anti hezbollah pro hezbollah it doesn't matter that's where they're going to all come down on that's that's exactly it. So simplify it. That's where that's where that's what the Lebanese are. That's how irrelevant to this space. It's it's an it's an issue of Iran and the United States and how uh, after Barack Obama, where Israel falls in this equation. And Barack Obama said to the Israelis, "You're on the side now. I'm dealing with Iran." So this is all. So if if you don't understand this. You can't really understand anything that's happening. And if you understand this, what becomes the imperative for Israel? I mean, we're going to lose the North. You know, where like the idea of capitulation in Mount Dope is so insane. The idea of reaching and I mean, like the deal that they're talking about, in my mind, is 
like the I, I can't believe that anybody in Israel could even could even right. take this seriously. But then again, I can't understand why anybody in Israel would take the deal with Hamas seriously. But but let's just talk for a second about what it is that's on the negotiating t- table here. What would it do to Hezbollah's forces? You know the Radwan brigades in southern Lebanon. What, how would it cha- What how would it impact? what they can do to Israel, et cetera. Walk us through this deal right. that's on the table now yep. from, from, from that's a perfect, just what is in it. You know, it's a perfect time to do that. So let's, let's, so what's on the table. I mean, there's, there are various leaks as to what was proposed and there are different iterations of it, but basically the bottom line is this, we, we mentioned 1701, right? The 2006 uh, resolution, 1701 <clears throat> said, stipulated that the area south of the Litani river in Lebanon, all the way to the blue line of the border is to be uh, completely emptied out of all military presence and weapons, save for those of Unifil and the Lebanese army, right? That's, that was the thing. Uh, obviously, it's, <laughs> it was just not, uh, never, uh, never going to happen. Um, now, what, what uh, the Americans are proposing is something less than that. Just to, just and to first, let's just talk for we... one second about how stupid that was. Okay, so Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State in 2006, and she had this idea that the Lebanese armed forces were the knight in shining armor, that they were going to solve everything, that they were an independent force. And really, since then, the United States has been bankrolling and training and arming the Lebanese armed forces. But where are the Lebanese armed forces vis a vis as well? Are they really an independent force? No, no, of course not. So there's two things on the one hand, I mean, or three things, if you like. So on the one hand, they're auxiliaries of Hezbollah. So they they uh, and uh, they cooperate with Hezbollah. So all the stuff that Unifil has been, like whenever Unifil actually tried to, let's say, run patrols in areas that they didn't, you know, that, they, that Hezbollah didn't want them to go to, uh, it's the Lebanese army who intervenes and gets and moves them, right? Uh, or, or... Hezbollah says, you can't come in there unless you're accompanied by the military. Why would Hezbollah feel this confidence in the military accompanying unit? Um, they, they also, um, um, uh, I mean, there's obviously the, the, you know, just the sectarian makeup of the military and the presence of, of uh, Shia and other officers who are, uh, that, that that Hezbollah feels okay, but that's but that's kind of like almost a secondary point. The, the whole seventeen oh one itself was putting the the cat in charge of the cream. It was saying, okay, uh, the Lebanese armed forces, which is controlled by Hezbollah, is going to prevent Hezbollah well, from from operating in this. There's a there's a step above that actually because it's the Lebanese government, right? So the Lebanese armed forces are not an autonomous decision making entity. Right. They uh, they are uh, not just their makeup is sectarian, but their their decision making is contingent on the uh, sectarian political uh, setup in Lebanon system. So they respond to directives by by the government and Hezbollah is in the government. And people should understand that when we say, well, the Lebanese government And, and people talk about Hezbollah as a non-state actor. That's a misnomer. Hezbollah is in parliament and Hezbollah is in government. Leave aside the fact that it's outside the government. It controls de facto through force of arms, everything and money and the economy and the ports of entry and all of these things and demographically and all, leave aside all of these real factors. Even within the facade of the Lebanese system, Hezbollah is part of that government. It is part of the state institutions. It is part of the state. It's not a non-state actor. It is very much a state actor. So the idea that, well, the Lebanese institutions are on the one hand and Hezbollah is somehow on the other end, and they're false. That's not reality in Lebanon. That's not how things work, right? They're all like this, okay? So the idea of the Lebanese government taking action and then commissioning the or uh, delegating the Lebanese armed forces to take action is hilarious to anyone who knows anything about how Lebanon functions. 
it's hilarious. It's it's it, it's it's complicity. They're complicit together. They're not. So that that's on the one hand. Um, what, however, the United States is knows this and it's using that to its advantage. So one of the sweeteners that Hochstein is offering in this deal is more economic investment. And it's funny because they always say South Lebanon, economic investment in South Lebanon, i.e. in Hezbollah land, very specifically. I mean, all of Lebanon is in Hezbollah land, but in terms of the concentration of its um, uh, uh, sectarian constituents, it's South Lebanon. And here's the American envoy saying, yeah, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay your people and I'm going to invest American money in you, Hezbollah, number one. And number two, we're going to enlarge the Lebanese armed force. So everything that we talked about as laughable in terms of the 1701 with regard to the LAF, they're going to put it on steroid. Why? Because it's a money laundering mechanism. It's just a way for the United States to now pump more cash into Lebanon. Remember, a few months ago, they were sending them in cash, in cash, salaries. They were paying the salaries of the military in Lebanon for six months. They did that. That's illegal, incidentally. You're, the United States cannot pay uh, foreign militaries. They paid them in cash for six months. Uh, and now what they're saying is we're going to enlarge the LAF by another 10,000 people. Uh, and we're going to equip them, equip them and we're going to train them and we're going to pump even more money into them. It's a, it's a, it's a money laundering mechanism, essentially, is what it is. It enables the United States to pay Hezbollah indirectly as... as it's as not just that. It's saying, Israel, we're going to expand this enemy armed force that is arrayed against you. We're going to train it against you. We're going to arm it against you. And we're going to be gonna pay it's it's our payment. asset. This is our asset. So it's an additional constraint on your ability to act because if you act against these guys, you're acting against us. We're planting the American flag right on your board. And incidentally, that's what they're going to do in Gaza too. That's the plan for Gaza. The plan for Gaza with Michael Finzel, the uh, security coordinator, is to create basically the Palestinian version of the LAF and to put it in Gaza uh, a, a, as part of the day after plan. And basically, it's it's to plant the American flag in Gaza, and and and, and which they tried to do in the West Bank, too, to try to to um, curtail Israeli uh, IDF activity in, in the West Bank. That's the idea. Was we stand up a Palestinian force, and that makes it less necessary for Israel to do that. And then we will be taking care of the security. Uh, and then we'll start, you know, our campaign against the settlers, the violent settlers, and you know, and then you, you're you're putting an American umbrella over both enclaves, and that I think that that plan is predicated on the Lebanon model, on the model that the United States established uh, in in Lebanon. So, so now just a, one last thing. So, in addition to paying the military, paying Hezbollah's uh, sort of investing in Hezbollah's economy. Uh, reopening the territorial claims that are completely frivolous um, and, and nobody, you know, nobody in the world accepts Shaba as Lebanese. Even if they say it's occupied, they say it's occupied to the Syrians. It's not, it's, it's for the Syrians, it's part of the Syrian land, it's not part of Lebanon. Um, they're going to negotiate that, right? And, and on top of all of that, we're going to dilute the territorial buffer instead of north of the Litani River, you're just going to go like seven to eight, maybe 10 kilometers up, which is a farce. And everyone recognizes it's a farce because how would you enforce that? How would you enforce Hezbollah, who, who people who live there, who live in the South, Hezbollah members who live in the South, right? And whose infrastructure is underground in the entirety of the South. How are you going to enforce them pulling back and not even to what the 1701 says, less, le, you know, a, 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 a less, lesser distance. That's that's one more thing. And then here's the, but here's, leave all of that aside. The real issue, why the Lebanese all of a sudden are saying, oh yes, we want the complete implementation of 1701. Okay, what does that mean? Here's what that means, because they've reinvented, they've reinterpreted the 1701 
So now full implementation means Israel cannot have overflights over Lebanon. It's to deny Israeli overflights. That's the full implementation. It's just the territorial stuff like, you know, we'll, we'll fix the border, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and of course, you pay the army, and that's us implementing 1701 by you paying us and enlarging the army, right? Nobody does anything with regard to Hezbollah, but you tell the Israelis that they have to stop their overflights. That's the whole point. That's all of what the conversation is about. It's to force uh, the end of Israeli overflights in Lebanon, which incidentally will not only affect Israel's intelligence capabilities inside Lebanon, but it will also affect its activity in Syria itself, because oftentimes Israel uses Lebanese air strike Iranian and Hezbollah assets in Syria. So in, in so doing, they're again connecting Lebanon and Syria together, just like they've connected Lebanon and Gaza and Palestine, and all in protection of Hezbollah and Iranian interests. It's really mind-boggling to believe to to, to 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 consider just how comprehensive the uh, Obama team's embrace and advocacy of Iranian interests across the board really is. It's it's actually astonishing because it's entirely irrational uh, from you know from perspectives like what you're tying yourself to a bunch of lunatic terrorists, whatever. But that's that's what that faction, this this ruling faction in Washington, this ruling faction in the Democratic Party, that's what it tied itself to. It tied itself to those guys. So okay, so all right, so so you, uh, my I went like this because my brain, I have to like keep it inside my skull because it's about to explode. So 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 I should be wearing a helmet right now just to protect the anyway, So uh, to prevent my my brain from exploding by what you said and and. There are tens of thousands of Hezbollah forces along the border with Israel that, you know, the reason why we have 80,000 internal refugees from the northern border communities is because we were afraid we were, they, that they were going to turn Avivim into Be'eri and Metula and Kiryat Shmona into Kfaraza and Sterot. So uh, that's why everybody's in hotels and has been for the past 10 months. And the question is, you know, none of this deal that's on the table is going to let anybody go home because the, the deal has no implication for Hezbollah's forces, does it? And I mean, given everything that we know about the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces and UNIFIL, and now everything that we understand about the American policy, nobody's going to enforce this. They're not dead. They're, you know, the ones that haven't been killed are alive and they're winning. And so the the threat against Israel, uh, the actual concrete threat on the ground, boots on the ground, rockets in their hands, missiles in their hands, it's still there. It's unaffected. And in fact, it's empowered and entrenched even more because the United States is now openly siding with them and equipping them. Because like you said, they're going to give them 10,000 more troops, presumably with arms, with artillery shells, with everything, with nods, with night, night goggles and all the rest of it. So they're going to have all of this advanced equipment, courtesy of American taxpayers, and and they're going to seven seven kilometers north of Litani, and anyway, that's not going to be enforceable, and anyway, they live there. Right. So the the the, the threat against Israel is going to be expanded, not not diminished. Is that correct? In, in strategic terms, yes. So here, here's what the U.S. is offering, right? It's it's basically a shell game, right? So what the United States is offering is the is the fall. We're going to return to a October six reality, or in the case of Lebanon, October seven, I suppose, reality, uh, uh, whereby um, everyone is going to pretend that you know. Uh, you know, we will do some vis visual trickery, you know, like we might remove a, you know, one of those environmental observation posts that Hezbollah set up, right? And instead, it's going to be an LAF post, whatever, okay? Uh, uh, and um, we're going to say that Hezbollah is no longer there. They're 10 kilometers away, right? And, and so you're not going to have anything visible. But it's basically just because Hezbollah has, it's based on Hezbollah's decision not to attack or whether to attack. Shaba Farms may be an exception, we're not quite sure yet. Uh, but basically, you are going to end this round where, and, and freeze in place. And 
it'll be quiet like it was in the lead up to October 7th. That's the, that's what's on offer. Plus, uh, but, uh, rather, uh, except for what the, what the strategic reality that has take that has taken shape over the last nine months, which is what, which is that Nas uh, Hezbollah has shown that it can empty northern Israel of its uh, of its uh, inhabitants, right? Uh, it can. Uh, operate under American protection that prevents Israel and is and, and also Israel itself may be self-deterred because we can open another front somewhere else that preoccupies Israel so it makes Israel reticent about whether uh, or hesitant about whether or not to 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 open a second front but it doesn't matter the point is we can depopulate northern Israel we can open a front and not incur massive destruction from an Israeli retaliation, all under American protection. And then we can call up the Americans to ratify this strategic reality in some sort of an agreement. That's now, that's, that's the new strategic reality. And that is not a good place for Israel to be. But there's another thing too. One of the, in, one of the points of this purported deal that the uh, Americans are, are pushing is, uh, that just as there is a redeployment, so-called, of um, Hezbollah troops from the border, Israeli troops have to redeploy and demobilize. So the the sovereign military of a sorry, the military of a sovereign state has to redeploy to mirror the deployment of a terrorist organization. That's the American initiative, right? So again, to that's go one of the reports. I mean, I, it, it is a report. It's not the only one, but it, I think it, yes, other it, reports it was that's not true. I believe, I believe it was sourced. I have to double check. I should have checked, but I, I believe it was sourced to American officials. So um, uh, anyway, we'll, but, but the point of it is it doesn't matter whether that ends up taking place or not. The point is the premise. And the right. premise is the same thing that the mar that's the significance of the maritime agreement at the time that's what i wrote it's like you all are missing the point the right. strategic reality that this agreement puts in place is extremely bad for israel it means that the united states is taking hezbollah and israel and treating them on equal uh, putting them on equal footing 1701 did that as well i mean let's just be clear yeah, well it to a, to a certain extent and by the way there's another mechanism also that's reported in this deal that kind of harkens back to 1996 whereby you create a group of external state actors uh just like in 1996 there was this called the april understanding of 1996 uh, when when israel and hezbollah were fighting uh uh in, in South Lebanon prior to the Israeli withdrawal. And they, and they came, and this is something that Nasrallah has wanted to re in, um, reactivate since 2006, because he lost it. Well, then it's also what Burrell from the EU was uh, trying to reinstate uh, in response to the massacre of the children, where he said, oh, we need an international commission to see who really is responsible. Well, yeah, well, for I mean, yeah, that, that's kind of related. Of me, right? It's related to it. It's slightly separate, but it's, but the point is that it's, it's what Hezbollah wants, which basically creates a, 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 an international body, not an internet, a, a body of states, regional states and European states, who, by the way, are all have have uh, um, uh, soldiers in South Lebanon right at under uh, at, at Hezbollah's mercy. Right. Um, and and the United States, which also is invested in Lebanon. All of these guys then decide to and arbitrate the tempo and the scope of military engagement between the state of Israel and this terrorist organization. Right. right. So we, 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 we could go on for the next hour and a half, but I, I think that my brains would be, you know, somewhere <laughs> all over the floor and my kids would have to wipe it up and it would be a mess. So let me just ask you, if you, if you had the ear of the general staff of the Israeli defense force and of uh, prime minister Netanyahu, how what would what would you what would what would it what would it, the advice that you what would be the advice that you give them i mean uh i, I the advice i give is what i've already written right it's i'm i'm, I'm a writer uh, you know i'm not a consultant or anything of like that so and a so, good one <laughs> thank you so the, the 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 point is 
uh, recognize that the United States is not on your side in Lebanon. You are on opposite sides with the United States in Lebanon. The United States has taken up Lebanon as a protectorate, which means de facto, by virtue of physical reality, that it is a protector of Hezbollah by, by virtue of, uh, of its position in, in Lebanon. Recognize that. Now, everything else, you know, ammunition, def uh, autonomy and defense policy, tactical considerations, the uh, uh, iron beam, winter coming, all of that. It's, it's not my business. I don't, I don't know that. That's for the military people. The key issue to recognize is that the United States and Israel are on opposite sides in Lebanon. And that is not just an isolated event. It is part of a broader regional um, strategic map that has been uh, coming into fruition since Barack Obama in 2015, maybe even 2013. Uh, and it is uh, adversarial to Israel. It, it diminishes Israel's sovereignty and constrains its margin uh, for maneuver and, and its ability to defend itself. Um, that's that's the main thing. Second, a secondary thing is like nobody cares about what the people of Lebanon think. Or don't waste your time uh, on that. The 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 Israeli uh, interest in Lebanon is uh, military. It's 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 at the strategic level. It's military. It uh, the people of Lebanon, such as they are, are completely irrelevant. The political end game of what comes next in Lebanon completely irrelevant, and then finally three, uh, don't lose sight of uh, of uh, of Iraq. What do you mean? Well, I mean because the United States, everything that I just described, what the United States is doing, it's not just doing it in a vacuum; it's doing it as part of a partnership with Iran. All right, I, I mean, look, I think I think you're right, and I think the most important thing when you're facing a challenge of the dimensions of Lebanon uh, that we just keep getting glimpses of with the with the anti with the anti tank rockets that are decimating the landscape of northern Israel and just just decimated the children um, is. Uh, when you're looking at a strategic threat of this dimension, the most important thing that you have to do before you do anything else is understand the strategic landscape. And one of the biggest problems that we've been facing in Israel is our is our chattering class's refusal to reconcile with the strategic landscape of Lebanon. And this has been an ongoing failure, an ongoing refusal on their part, you know, going back even, you know, proceeding the 2006 war, going back to uh, Ehud Barak's disastrous decision to withdraw from the security zone uh, in May of 2000, uh, thinking that if we just turned our backs on Lebanon, that Lebanon would leave us alone, failing completely under to understand the nature of the situation on the ground with Iran and Lebanon. So I think, you know, going back decades now, Israel, because it's too daunting, because it's too difficult, because for political considerations, for monetary considerations, for many, many considerations, uh, has refused to deal with it. And we've gotten to we've gotten to crunch time. We've gotten to, you know, we've gotten to to the H hour. And if we don't recognize the strategic landscape, we're going to be gobbled up by it. So I think that on that level, we should take encouragement from your dire warning and your very clear understanding of that strategic landscape. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go, and guys, don't worry. Uh, there'll be more to come this week, and uh, I'll give you more reasons to you know uh, start you know get get a get a big uh, mop so you can mop up your board. <laughs> and uh, uh, but whatever, it'll be all fine. It'll be all fine. Uh, it's got to be. It will be, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Tony, thanks again for coming back. I really appreciate it. And you're, such, such, uh, you're the best. And guys, uh, after you're done reading JNS, like all day long, you got to go to Savile. They have fantastic articles. And Tony is doing a great job, both as a writer and an editor there. So that's all. Uh, kudos to Tony. And thanks for listening. And we'll see you again soon. Take care.